Hello everyone and welcome to uh, today's Lunchtime in Conversation. Um, I want to start, my name is Courtney Stewart, I just want to start first of all by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we're all gathering on today. Um, I'm coming uh, to this conversation live um, from Gadigal land and I pay my respects to Elders past and present. <laughs> and acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. It's going well to start off with. My son is home um, from daycare today, so I apologise for that. He might be very excited to join the conversation. Um, I'd love to introduce to you our guest for today. is Shakti, who is a Western Sydney storyteller with Sri Lankan heritage and Tamil ancestry. He's a writer, director and producer of theatre and film. He's also a composer. He's currently an associate artist at Belvoir, as well as holding down the position of artistic director of Karinji, as well as co-curious to companies. Thank you so much, Shakti, for joining us today. Good to be here. Great to see us done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so pumped to be having this conversation with you because we, um, we've had an opportunity to kind of work together. Um, uh, at Belvoir uh, for the Artists at Work initiative there. So it's really, really wonderful to be able to have the opportunity to kind of talk to you um, a little bit more in depth about your practice as a storyteller um, and the different projects that you have, as well as your opinion um, and your ideas about where the industry is at the moment um, and what your kind of hopes and dreams are for the industry in the future. Um, but to start off with, it would be really great for those of us tuning in today who haven't come across your work before, for you to give us a bit of a background um, on yourself and as well as your artistic practice, like where you made your start in the industry. Um, I was quite um, naive and hopeful when I was at uni um, in my late teens. And um, I knew that uh, the kind of Australia I was living in, um, I couldn't really find it on our screens or stages. And I had done the, the semi right thing by my family by doing a journalism degree, um, which is the most like acceptable version of that. And then, um, but I knew I wanted to work in the arts. And so, um, like I said, I was quite naive and, and had lots of energy. So I, um, because I couldn't find anywhere that was doing what I wanted to do, I, I set up a company. Um, it was called Curious Works. Um, and it, it ended up taking over my life and I was there for 15 years. Um, and I really came up through, um, the community arts part of our industry. And the reason for that was because I kind of started Curious Works thinking that addressing the, the kind of gap in the stories this country tells would be a case of telling, um, those lesser told stories. But once I got into it um, and really figured out what was going on, it became clear that, you know, the reason that imbalance was there was systemic, you know, and it wasn't just um, a lack of um, those things happening, but more like systemic reasons that, that really would stopped it happening for the long term. And so unlocking that and really getting into the, nitty gritty of what it takes for those stories to be told for me anyway meant learning about community arts practice and um what was kind of incredible about that was just learning how amazing australia is at community arts practice and we're one of the best countries in the world at it and um uh it's been a it was a real eye-opener for me yeah and so i've stepped back from curious works now but they're still um a thriving community arts company uh, out in Kasula. That was how I started. And these days um, I um, mainly write and direct a little bit and I'm also involved in kind of um, how to use that community arts methodology in more um, substantive budget, budget productions <laughs> on that end of town and how that, um, you know, and it's, it's interesting because it kind of um, meets a lot of the diversity stuff that's happening now, but, um, mm. but it's always been about how you work with 
community and how you work with people and how that translates into the, the kind of work you make. And do you think that, you know, you're talking about um, how to kind of bring the methodology or those kind of core values into your other artistic work. Has that been quite easy as you've moved into working with more main stage companies um, and more, you know, in more traditional modes? Has it been quite like easy or quite hard to kind of hold on to those practices? Well, I guess Candy and Cracking was the biggest um, version of that. And the, um, and that, so that was, for those who don't know, it was a, it was a big play. It was on it in 2019 at Sydney and Adelaide festivals, but it had 16 actors and they were from six different countries and it went for three and a half hours and there were three musicians. And, um, but that entire play was written out of a process of working with the Sri Lankan community. And, um, it was a co-production between Co-Curious and Belvoir. So I think on Belvoir's end, um, what wasn't difficult about it was that from the very beginning, um, Eamon and I, Eamon's the AD of Belvoir, kind of, we both knew that it would, this would require a new way of making work. And it sounds simple, but I think that's a trap that a lot of people fall into is that they find out halfway through the process that, oh, we have to make this work differently to how we ever made anything before. And if that's not said at the beginning and known at the beginning, then that's going to create some anxiety within the team. Um, and so that, I think, was a game changer and, and everyone knew that. But it got very difficult at various points um, because it was a really expensive show, um, because it was a very demanding show and everyone involved emotionally, practically, work-wise. And um, the... It's always difficult to be involved in big change at the same time as being stressed. And those mm. the times where it got more difficult. Um, but the show is um, part of the way my community negotiates its understanding with itself and is very much an Australian story as much as a Sri Lankan story and is so wrapped up in how we see ourselves. And I think that the kind of visceral reaction it had in audiences and just how much it meant to the people, it meant something to um, um, was a necessary and um, kind of completion to the fact that the difficulty was worth it. Yeah, and it sure. went well too, you know. It, it really did. It was it was a massive success um, for those people tuning in today who don't know the history of the work. Can you give us a bit of an insight into how long it took to to make the work from inception to decade. what we saw on stage? Yeah, it was yeah. about a decade. Yeah, the, but you know, the getting the script together took a long time, and the research for it took a number of years, um, and the um, and this is where I think it would have been different if I wasn't a community artist because um, I thought going into it that it was a, um, going to be about me finding out more about my roots and the kinds of things that, I, I had, that had been kept from me really about what our family was and why we left Sri Lanka. And, um, the, and I could have written that play, but it's, I started first by just talking to to, to lots and lots and lots of Sri Lankans here and abroad. And that really changed it. And um, it became a play about a particular way of telling the modern history of Sri Lanka that hasn't been told enough. And um, it's a kind of people's history and, and marrying that story with the story of a family, you know, telling the story of a family and a nation at once. And um, my mother really opened up during the process and talked about Sri Lanka because of the early drafts of the play and what it opened up in her in a way she'd never had before in my life and all of the stuff she started saying changed the play too so because I was first in community arts and grew up with that this kind of um, process of letting community be a powerful guide of the work just kind of met that that really well and it completely changed the work you know um, and the so that 
took a number of years. And then the th other thing that took a long time was, um, you know, Wesley was a big supporter at Sydney Festival. Eamon was a big supporter in Belvoir where um, Adelaide Festival came on board. But there was a lot of, you know, there were people who weren't supporters of it. And um, the kind of coalition we had to gather to make it financially possible, but also um, possible in terms of artistic vision really took a long time. Longer than I thought, you know, longer than I thought. Yeah. And um, so that was the second hump. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we were stressed, like, because if it had failed, it would have been a really good reason to stop other projects like that going ahead in the future. So, um, yeah. It, so we really had to make sure that it didn't so that we, you know, we could prove that you can put works like that on and people will come that um, audiences who love the theatre will come that audiences who never normally go to the theatre will come and um, and that it's that so many of those concerns and risks that people raise during the journey um, shouldn't be things that stop those shows in the future. Absolutely. I mean, it just feels like such a huge hoop to have to jump through in order to kind of prove this you know, the continuing of new work like that. I think what feels so meaningful too is um, having creatives facilitate those processes that are either deeply entrenched in that cultural knowledge or or do have that kind of that community arts mindset and, and understanding of how to work with artists and personal stories because it feels like there's a hunger for those kind of stories on stage, but they, I don't, think we're quite at that stage yet in our industry where we have um, enough facilitators in positions who have that skill set to be able to do that in a really meaningful, careful, sensitive way. So, um, I, I, you know, I wonder if that's another reason why the process, while it was stressful, um, you know, you guys came through it and were really a tight knit group at the end and it was, it was so successful and it really touched and reached community in the way it sounds like that you were hoping it would. Yeah, absolutely. I think the bigger institutions have like, you know, we don't have enough time to get into it deeply, but the kind of um, way that the process of art making has ended up in, in so many um, Western democracies in particular has been a focus on um, uh there's so much focus on the craft of theater as an isolated thing unto itself. And, you know, what happens in the theater making process and the artists that create it and the result, you know, is, is not demystified and um, separate to the world it comes from, you know, and then audiences come and consume it as a product. And I think at the heart of community arts and, and, and other types of thinking that are more inclusive is an assumption, and, and I think this exists in lots of traditional cultures, is the assumption that um, the stories we tell about ourselves is essential to how we live in this world and that there is a necessary relationship between any community, community and its storytellers. And mm. um, there is a very, very long and at times painful bridge to build, probably many of them, um, to labor the metaphor, that needs to happen to, to, to change the culture of those institutions to go back to thinking about theater that way. Um, but, but that's the only reason I make it in the first place, I'm sure that is the same passion for many other people of all sorts of different races in the world. And um, it would benefit a great deal of us to return our institutions to understanding theatre in that way first, and then building a producing model from that, that reflects that very necessary role storytelling can play in our lives. Mm, absolutely. I mean, I completely agree. I also think that we greatly underestimate what our audiences want to see and the kinds of stories that they will find interesting. But also, it definitely feels like the role of companies who are putting out artistic content to stretch and to train audiences to, you know, 
digest and consume lots of different types of stories. I think that's a really powerful position, I think, because storytelling is so incredible in its transformative power, I think, because it gets you to empathise with people in situations that aren't necessarily your own. So I think it's really, it can be really powerful in that way. Yeah, um, we do underestimate audiences. Like there was a, in Act 2 of Counting and Cracking, there are several moments of the show that really are um, prioritised the Sri Lankan community as the primary audience. And um, I mean, and it, well, not just Act 2, like the show starts in Tamil, you know, and the, the, um, a classic, I don't know what you would call it, um, but a, a kind of not, a, an alternative way of looking at that show would be to not have those bits and to make it as um, uh, um, snappy a show as possible. Um, and the given knowledge were to say that you should do that because, you know, you don't want audiences to have to go through something they don't want to. But I found that uh, non-Sri Lankan audiences were incredibly open to that. And they, um, you know, people like you and I have spent our whole lives growing up in Australia, um, becoming experts at finding ways to be empathetic with material that really has nothing to do with us. And we found ways to, to reach into other people's lives and, you know, the kind of majority community lives on, on stage and screen. And um, I think it's really exciting to, to ask um, the majority communities to do that into the works we make now. And they're up for it, you know, they're up for it. And um, there's a, a process that will happen in the, in, within audiences in the theatre whereby um, they will now have to observe other audience members taking, like being part of this work and having that moment where they realise that this work is for that audience member. And part mm -hmm. of the theatrical experience is watching that exchange happen as well as the show. Um, and I, I think they're up for it. And I, you know, I think it's a really important um, um, stage to happen in the evolution of, of theatre in Australia. Absolutely. I mean, you know, everyone's having to kind of reassess processes in the wake of COVID anyway. So it feels like it's a great time to audit and take stock of sure. other ways that we can be doing things. Um, if we haven't found reason before now. <laughs> Agreed. Which we should have, <laughs> which we should have. Um, I think it'd be really great to hear about a, bit, a little bit more about your position at Belvoir and some of the projects and things that you've been involved um, in with that company at the moment. Yep, so it's twofold. I mean, after Canny Cracking, I am continuing to work with them as a writer, which is my relationship with them as an independent writer. And, you know, so there's some other works in development. We would have had a show this year um, that Eamon and I were making called the jungle and the sea, but it got postponed because of COVID. Um, but I was really excited about that because it, um, um, we only came up with that show after counting and cracking. It was going to be in the 2020 season. And um, it just felt like real change to me, you know, that it took 10 years for something like counting and cracking to happen, but that, but that it was possible then to repeat that in a way, um, you know, within a year could kind of meant that it was a very clear, practical symbol that change was in the air. Um, and similarly for community, like after County Cracking, lots of members of the community were asking what the next show was. And I spent a long time with community for County Cracking talking about the show. And I think I mainly just confused people. Like they were just like, I don't understand what this is or what you're trying to do. Or, and then they came to it and now they were asking what the next one was. And that also was a really clear, practical symbol of like, actual change like really critical change and so it just felt like institutions and audience and story were ready for that and it'll still happen but hopefully you know in a post-vaccine world but um um there's another the associate artist role at Belvoir is more about the um structural change that could be possible that organization and um um that stuff is knotty and messy and the, like I said, the model we used to make County and Cracking was a new producing model. And um, there is a desire at Belvoir um, from, the, from the top to the bottom to, to continue that model and see it result in other works. Um, and 
um, we are now engaged in a very, you know, messy process of figuring out how to, to embed a new process of making work into Belvoir. Um, and we've had to do that in the framework of um, being hit by coronavirus, which has really taken it all sideways. And what the silver lining of that is that we got to do ours at work and, and that, you know, we've been able to find a way to bring in um, a great deal of artists into that conversation that we might not have otherwise. And um, that, as you hinted at, that there is the possibility now of, like, you can say things now that you couldn't have before in terms of like, um, the, the change had to come from certain things were set in stone before coronavirus. And it feels like now nothing is set in stone anymore. <laughs> you know, um, programming cycles, um, who or what a work is for, why we exist in the first place. And so that's um, confronting, but yeah, is I think gonna open up a lot of possibilities for that structural change that weren't there before. Um, but to be perfectly honest, what's also very difficult about that is that the um, financial situation is now very different for, for companies. And so we're going to have to also think quite innovatively about how to make that all happen. You know, I kind of one of the really sad things about coronavirus was just going like, when could a work like County Kraken even ever happen again? You know, mm. uh, yeah, but we'll get back there. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. I mean, do you think it's about thinking of new, not only new models of making work, but new models for kind of, funding work and kind of getting resources together to kind of make works like that again i think it's about things that might be extremely boring to some of the people out there listening but like that are to do with um finding efficiencies no like committing to a particular way of making work and finding ways to do it efficiently like the um it's, a, it's about how to, how can our big institutions, like NIDA must be going through this as well, um, find the courage to accept that the change is needed, but then really properly look at what needs to be done for that change. And then instead of like trying to add it on or um, make it component B while they do component A is business as usual, I think we have to find a way to go like, no, this needs to be like the change that happens across the board and it needs to become what we do as an organization. And then the money issue is not as big a deal, you know, because, it, because it, it's about saying that that change is actually gonna become the mission of the company, of the institution. Um, mm. But that requires a great deal of courage. <laughs> and, For and, sure. You know, the, and, and it's really, it's in that, at a board level. Massively, massively. Um, I think that's institution wide for sure. Um, I think we're going to come back to that actually. I think we'll put a pin in that and I think we'll, come, we'll circle back around to that um, sure. a little bit later in our conversation. Um, I think it, I, I would love to hear more about your work with Co Curious and Karinji and really kind of letting us know what those companies are about, your position within them, and the works that they do. Sure. Um, so, Co Curious is a sister company to Curious Works. And it's about um, using community arts methodologies in more high profile stage and screen works. Um, and so like the company is a few weeks away from starting to shoot a feature film. And that, and that feature film is, you know, has been supported by Screen Australia and Create New South Wales and the ABC and um, has, um, um, Blake Ashford and Sheila Jayadev attached and, you know, people who work um, on, on, the, on the bigger end of the TV and, and feature market. Um, but it's a feature film co-written by eight, by eight writers from Western Sydney. Um, um, some of them, you know, it's their first um, film credit. Um, it has come through a process of them, um, you know, writing that material out of what they desire to write about for their communities. Um, they are working as associate producers 
um, through pre-production and production to be, you know, you know, which is a separate paid role across um, how community intersects, intersects with um, all the other elements of, of, of how a film is made. Um, and, you know, they are staying a core part of the process throughout the whole life cycle of the production. And it's a co-production with Emerald Pictures. Um, and so there's a kind of marriage there of a community arts process and a um, more high-end filmmaking um, process and TV process. And so that's kind of what the company's um, really trying to do, you know, it's um, called Co-Curious because everything will be a co-production and it's about bringing um, the industry expertise and wisdom and um, the uh, financial support you're able to access when you have that um, and, and, and bringing that to marry with um, people who have the ability and the talent and the capacity to be um, cultural leaders in their communities and, and to make their breakout works and um, to support them through a community arts process, but in a high profile work, yeah. Um, and there's also a similar project that's in its early days with, with Belvoir, um, where we're working with four writers from Western Sydney, um, co-writing uh, a play in development with Belvoir as well through exactly that same methodology. Um, and so the hope is that we can, um, you know, say that we we deserve to own that space you know that the the um main or key places that theater film or tv are made in australia um should be the places that um these artists get to be in as well and that um the community arts process doesn't have to sit within you know just the more grassroots or smaller scale um Place and that methodology can 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 come into and, and have its own power in the on the bigger budget end of town. Karina yeah. is a home for um, the work that uh, that I do and um, that um, Amay Falzon does. I've been working with for a long time and the kinds of people we work with. Um, and it is, um, I I hope it be, you know it's. I'm really interested in finding ways to. Um, a, to explore and eventually shake up the form of theatre and film in this country. And I'm really excited by um, so much of the way that I feel Australian and the way that I feel welcomed here has been um, through the, um, the times I've spent working with Indigenous communities around this, this country. And, um, and I've, done a, I've done a lot of that because of Curious Works and um, I just feel so comfortable in those communities. They remind me of um, so much of life in Sri Lanka. And um, I, I come, my mother's a Bharatanatyam dancer and I, I grew up in a world in which um, art was um, inseparable from life and spirituality and the storytelling of a culture and the mythology of a culture. Um, where music and dance and text and design and poetry were all intermingled and all came from a, um, a, a kind of greater worldview um, and philosophy that I've already talked about that is really similar to community arts. And I've, I've found it such a beautiful um, picture of solidarity that I found that in, in so many Indigenous communities as well. And so I think that is a basis for a form of work um, and, uh, and a way to interrogate the, the form of the work we make. Um, and it's, that's super baby stages, you know, but um, um, Karinji would be a home for, for trying to figure that out, you know. And so we, we've got a collaboration at the moment with a, Singa a group in Singapore called Sada Collective, who are a group of musicians and contemporary artists um, exploring this very thing, you know, in terms of the similarities between um, their traditional um, Chinese heritage based music um, what I've experienced in my South Asian heritage, and that's also Jasmine Shepherd to collaborate on that ex Bangara dancer, um, Tagalak woman from remote Queensland. And so, you know, the kind of shared um, artistic heritages we have, but also telling a contemporary Australian story. Mm. I mean, so it's interesting to note that the idea of multidisciplinary work feels 
like that's thrown around as quite a well not necessarily a new way of working it's something that's only kind of recently happened yeah, in the last totally. you know couple of decades but it's not really yeah, if you look at yeah yeah ancient idea yeah. for sure absolutely um, multiculturalism and australia is a gathering place and you know as soon as you start to realize australia is a part of an asia more than anything else <laughs> and that um you know like northern australia is such a picture of that and um you you realize that this stuff is more part of the lifeblood of this country than than the kind of more dominant ideas that have come from its recent history and so yeah. part of this process is realigning with that hmm. for sure and intercultural practice as well i think that's something that feels like newer territory that the industry feels like it's navigating but it's something that's been happening for generations and generations as well and there's people so there's... we can lean on to talk to about that you know, exactly um, yeah hundreds of years within their own communities yeah definitely um, I should mention at this point in the conversation if you have any questions please feel free to pop them in the Q&A box um, for us to answer as we go we'd love to hear your questions and answer them as well um, Shakti I am interested to hear from you uh, any like who are some of the most exciting um Asian Australian performers that you've seen in you know recent recent years. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the thing, I mean, I'm not really answering your question, but I think something that's been um, really exciting for me recently has been. Um, so there's this nascent kind of initiative that myself and a group of other South Asian Australian artists have been developing called Homework, um, which has been, you know, getting together a group of um, South Asian Australian artists to, to, to look at what, you know, our answers to all the questions we've been talking about. And Nitya Nagarajan who has been part of that, um, has come, is an artist who's come from from India, and she's been organizing a, with coronavirus a bunch of um, online sessions with um, artists in India and, and around the world of South Asian heritage. Um, and people like Amitesh Grover, Malika Tanenja, Shazad Dawood, Sanjuk Dawag, Afra Shafiq, Anuja Goshaka, if you want to Google any of these people. And it's just been an incredibly enlightening experience for me because I. I have, it just, we so often in Australia look to Europe and the US for um, some kind of example of where we might go to or become and where kind of bigger population countries do their, their bigger things and, um, and, and, and as exemplars of what um, our practice could be. And, the the kind of ongoing experience over these last six months of touching base with um asian artists across asia and just the incredible practice they have um because it hasn't been as you know this this kind of there's a lot more resistance there to um the the colonial influences in those countries than than that then we have managed to master to be honest and um the and just seeing what that means about their practice um has been really inspiring for me and what it awoke me to was the fact that there's the possibility of um developing an australian form that is in dialogue with those artists you know um who are the cutting edge of arts practice in, across different countries in asia and I just find that it's a sideways answer to your question, but I find that to be the most exciting thing for me at the moment. And um, I remember Eamon saying once, like, um, you know, about the effect of counting and cracking and going like the, the kind of version of Sri Lanka's modern history that's told in counting and cracking. Um, there's a, I'm a Tamil Sri Lankan and there's a Sinhalese, a number of Sinhalese Sri Lankans in the show, but one of them, um, a young singer Sri Lankan, Nipuni, she had a very emotional reaction with the show because there were 
people who were worried about her doing it because it was written by Tamil Sri Lankan and kind of all the things that exist in a community after decades of civil war. And, um, and she, you know, I remember someone asking her in a Q&A after Candy and Cracking one night about, about the effect the show had on her. And it was a very emotional response for her. I remember her saying that, that the history that's in that show is not taught in schools anymore in Sri Lanka. And I remember Eamon reflecting that how funny it is that an Australian company might have that effect on the communities of the country in Asia. And it is, there's something there, you know, about the kind of leadership role we can play in Australia within our region in Australia, which isn't um, uh, dominating or we know best centered, but really takes the best of what we have and the best of what they have to, um, to achieve the kind of community outcomes and artistic outcomes in both countries that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. And I, I just don't think that's happening at all, at all in our industry. And I, so that's what's, what's exciting me at the moment because there's so much fertile ground there um, to explore. And um, I wish we did more of that. You know, I wish we did more of, I guess what I'm talking about is a kind of really innovative and ongoing commitment to an exchange between our homelands and the places and Australia now and, and, and what that setting up those artistic um, collaborations long-term and strongly would look like. Mm. It's quite interesting to hear you talk about, you know, Australia potentially, you know, kind of being that conduit in a way to tell and share that history and that knowledge when there are certain things in this country that we don't face and don't teach in our schools as well about our own history. Totally. Do you, do you, um, do you mean that uh, these processes, well, these processes, it sounds like are being led by members from the diasporic community. Is that, yeah. is that, that's what you mean, isn't it? Yeah. Rather than, you know, Caucasian facilitators yeah, taking your story. Yeah. All diasporic. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's quite, I think that's really interesting because I think being, being from a particular diaspora gives you, it kind of gives you a lens to view both histories, a lens with which to view both histories through. And, and I think there's something, the confluence of that happening within you as an individual kind of gives you a very unique perspective, not only on the content, but the processes that you need to employ to be able to navigate that content in yeah, creative practice. That's our life experience, you know, like yeah. part of my inner being will always be in Sri Lanka, even though I'm Australian and um, that's just how we live every day. And so there's something there um, as long as it's within, within those philosophies of, that we discussed, you know, cause there's plenty of examples of arrogant, idiotic diasporas too. But, um, but there's so much good possibility there if we can find equal footing. And mm. it's, yeah, it's, um, it has all those other good consequences too that are not just artistic, but to do with better cementing where we actually are ge geographically in the world. Sure, for sure. Contextualizing always, like knowing where you sit in relation to the rest of the world is so important, so important. Um, this is kind of a dreaming on of that, but also kind of circles back to something we were talking about before. What do you think the role of certain institutions like NIDA um, have in terms of increasing engagement with intercultural storytelling for our screens and stages? Mm. You know, I think it would be a very sad outcome if, we're at this moment now where people either because they feel like they're being forced to, or because they, there's just enough pressure and they, and they want to, um, are really understanding that there's a need for a diversification of the stories we tell and the people who tell them and, and, and that those lives matter and that, that those, that act of that is, essential to the future of our industry reflecting who we are but 
it, it could it could very easily turn out that we maintain business as usual but diversify um the skin color of the people who do it and i think it's kind of behoven to institutions like nida to continue the business of um training people up in the craft and um the the skills they need to, to to be an effective force in the industry but not to do it in a way which suggests to them either subliminally or explicitly that um they have to limit who they are or themselves in order to succeed in the industry and i think that i i do meet a bunch of people coming out of different institutions who have taken on that learning whether they've done it to themselves or been told it um and we have to find a way for training institutions to be really focused on training up people to know that they have the ability and the power and, and and giving them the skills to bring all of themselves to the role they'll then play in the industry when they leave those training institutions to change them you know and we need to know that um diversifying the types of people that are in industry should also lead to diversifying the process by which we make those stories and so i feel like that's a really critical role that those institutions like nana should play now which is the dual role of that they've always done of preparing people for the for the, for the craft and the practice um, but at the same time having an eye on what they might need to do and 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 be able to do in terms of 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 changing up what that is when they start their working life mm, definitely i think that also extends to you know people who are in positions of leadership at at those institutions taking an opportunity to upskill as well in certain areas to be able to know what processes need to be put in place to be able to support support exactly what you just said um so multifaceted and complex but so necessary and important yeah um, what has to happen you know yeah. so yeah because otherwise you end up in that alternative scenario i mentioned where it's we it might be five years from now where it's actually just the same but the, the look of it is more diverse. I, I hope it's more meaningful than that. <laughs> we hope so. We hope so. Um, what are some of your upcoming projects that we can keep an eye out for? I mean, obviously, everything is still kind of up in the air. We can only kind of project into the future so far. But all things going well, what are some things that are on the horizon for you? Um, so there's the jungle and the sea, which Eamon and I are making together, and that um, uh, is quite an interesting project because, um, on the one hand, it has a really intense and um, central community basis, and and Kelly and Cracking kind of um, focused on the, the build up to war in Sri Lanka, and jungle and the sea um, focuses more in on the um experience of people living through that war um but alongside that there's also elements inspired by parts of the mahabharata and antigone a sophocles in there and it is a kind of um leans on what mythology gives us in terms of processing grief and finding ways to heal um, and I'm finding that a really exciting space to bring those two worlds together um, so hopefully that will be on in a post-vaccine world um, the there's su or stay which is that work I was talking about with the Singaporean artists um, which is um, simultaneously set in um, the early 1800s in remote Queensland and contemporary Queensland um on a on the same piece of land on a on a, on a piece of farmland that's um post-colonialism being owned by the same family 
up to 200 or something years. Um, and um, hopefully that'll be out in the next couple of years. Um, and I've got a, I'm doing something um, kind of kooky with Kurunji um, that's been in the planning for a while, but um, many of the Kurunji projects um, will have interconnected characters and locations. And if you visit the website, um, if you Google Kurunji, kurunji.com.au, um, it's actually, um, they're mapped onto a timeline um, and slowly over like the next decade, um, this is where you find out how insane I am, but um, they're all, they're pro many of those Kurunji projects are gonna link up and be an alternative, collective alternative history of Australia. And the project, and you can kind of um, see via the timeline um, what projects, where they sit on that history and what have interlinking characters. And the characters have their own kind of online life as well. Um, so that's an unfolding project that just kind of gets added to randomly when I have time. Um, and I've got a feature film in development with Felix Media too, um, which is a um, kind of looking at um, uh, the, it's a it's a story, it's a Sri Lankan Australian story that you know is it's a drama it's about a family but it also has um, a hell of a lot of Bharatanatyam um, dance and Carnatic music in it and um, is uh, a kind of look at how to um, present some of that art form in a less um, um, in a stripped back way, yeah, in, and um, and to kind of show its, its essence as part of story and part of this family's life, because it's an extremely rich and um, ceremonial and kind of overwhelming art form on stage. And um, yeah, so, and it just links to some of the other stuff we're talking about, about finding this new form, you know, that, that our yeah. work can have as an Asian Australian artist. So yeah, that's some of the Amazing. Things. So just tiny, just tiny projects, just just a few little small, <laughs> massive projects. They're Nothing, huge. Just, they're all things that take a long time and will come yeah. out. They come out. <laughs> great, great. Um, I think we have a little bit more time. Uh, I can't see any questions that have come up in the Q and A box. So please feel free to send them through um, before our chat wraps up in about eight minutes' time. I have another question. Um, I, and I hope it's relevant for the people that are tuning in today, but you mentioned um, at the beginning of our chat when we were talking about your start in the industry, um, is there any advice or anything? I want some milk. Okay, I'll get, I'll get you some milk. <laughs> is there any advice? Yeah, um, <laughs> is there any advice that you have for um, any students across the disciplines um, at NIDA uh, who might be grappling with this with some of the issues that you that you were grappling yeah. with when you first started? Um, I think it's really important in your twenties or your first kind of decade of um, experience to get out there and explore and experiment and um so i think it's really important to try lots of different things and um to keep coming back to what your practice might be as you go through each project and as you start to understand that to not be afraid of knowing that you're discovering um where you can have leadership capacity in the industry and what, what your actual voice and practice is. Um, and the way I think that I've learnt, I wish that I'd known back then, I think, to, to, to do that, to have like maximum positive effect for you is to try and have lots of different types of projects on. And so to have, have a project where you do lots of different roles and everyone else on that project is at a similar career point to you. And all of, you know, you're just gonna, you know, 
like at that point in my life, I was happy eating two minute noodles, you know, and kind of, you know, shooting a feature in nine days or something or putting on a show in two weeks or whatever. And, and, um, and so those things are just brilliant learning exercises and, and ways to find your practice. And then it's really important to have a, a couple of projects where you're the least experienced person in the room. Um, and, you know, because those things end up being master classes for you, but in the best way, because they're, they're part of an actual project and it's all um, happening. Um, and to have that mix is really good. And what that means is that as you start to develop and know your practice, because of those other projects where you're the least experienced person in the room, um, you, you can invite those super experienced people to, to showings of your work when you're ready. I know, and then that cross fertilization starts to happen where you um, um, start to find yourself, yeah, and, and bring into um, bring that into the um, more well resourced sphere. Um, the other thing is to, if you think you're at the other end of that, <laughs> and you already know who you are, you're starting to find out who you are. I'd really encourage you to. Um, um, find a, 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 a your place in the matrix of um, knowing how much control you want to have over what, how expensive your idea is and how much patience you have. And I think a lot of people fall into problems because they haven't figured out that matrix right. They want to have control over everything, but they also want lots of money for their project and um, they want it to happen next year, you know? And it's, <laughs> um, if you um, feel like you're starting to find out what your voice and your practice is, and you're doing that thing, which we all have a responsibility to do, which is to bring our full selves to our work and find a way to change the kind of stories that are being told, as well as partake in them, then um, if you seek to have great control over that and for that to be really well resourced, then be patient and be persistent. Um, if you seek to do it more quickly, um, maybe put it with an idea that's more affordable and keep your bigger idea for later. And um, when I say these things, it sounds obvious, but very few people do it. You know, but most artists, like without that conscious thought, we all kind of just mess all this stuff up and we end up putting, you know, the, 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 the project that should have been more kind of five years down the track too early in our careers. And we, you know, and you, you just, we've all been in places where we've ended up kind of going, gosh, that would have been amazing if we'd had X amount more time or X amount more money or X amount more um, um, people involved in a certain way. And so um, sorting through that is, is really critical, I think, to, to, um, I say all this because it's really critical to succeeding the kind of change that we've talked about this whole chat. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason that change often doesn't happen and all these horrible experiences happen, we all know about, um, you know, we can't control what parts of the industry does that, that has no sympathy for what we're saying, but we can control those kinds of things I've been talking about to make sure we give ourselves the best possible chance of making that change happen in the work we do. Mm. For sure. I mean, that's such a, a fantastic mix of not only personal philosophy, but, you know, really kind of concrete yeah. um, steps that you can kind of take to ensuring those personal philosophies are successfully integrated into your practice. So yeah, that's got it much better than me. Super <laughs> helpful. Super, super helpful. I love a mix of personal philosophy and logical steps I can take. <laughs> I find that very helpful. <laughs> Um, that I, that's, we are just out of time. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we haven't had any questions come through. I hope that was relevant, um, for everyone that was tuning yeah, in today. I know that I, <laughs> I, um, it was super relevant for me, <laughs> if nothing else. I got a lot out of it. Thank you so much. I just want to say thank you to the team at NIDA for putting this together and for allowing, um, 
allowing myself the opportunity to uh, to, sh uh, to chat to Shakti. Shakti, thank you so much for being a legend as always, um, and I look forward to seeing you soon. I love that your boy was part of it too. So say hi to him for us. He wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye. <laughs>